This presentation, we will now finish the block of scripture of 1 Corinthians 8 through 13 by now going through 1 Corinthians chapters 11 through 13. As always, I would read these before watching this. Uh, I think it would be more helpful that way, but I'll leave that up to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. With apostolic insight, our inspired writer here proclaims certain basic and eternal principles pertaining to men and women and their relationship to each other. In view of these, he then approves or disapproves of certain local customs and traditions. Not that the local customs were of themselves either good or bad, but that their practice either added to or diminished from the proper reverence for and adherence to the basic Great, to the great basic concepts being set forth. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. As God is the head of Christ, and Christ is the head of man, so man is the head of women. Now, before you turn off the presentation, just because I read that, he is not saying that man is better than woman. He's saying that there is order in God's kingdom, and there can only be one head. Notice Christ has a head above him, God the Father. There has to be a straight line ahead, for if you had two equal heads, then you would get confusion. Such is the Lord's eternal order of government and control. God is a God of order, which requires there to be a head, one who presides. And in God's wisdom, he's delegated that to the male. He has not given us full reasons for that. And so that's why we put our faith and trust in him. For why he has ordered things the way he has. God is the God for which Christ would be head. One who presides just as the Father is the head of Christ. It doesn't make the Father any better than Christ. It just brings order to his kingdom. Women of Joseph Smith's day had few, if any, legal rights. In Blackstone's succinct summary, the husband and wife are one, and that one is the husband. Joseph Smith offered a unique but intelligent approach to the problem of granting and sustaining the rights of women under Zion's law. Some philosophies not only would make men and women equal as individuals, but alike, giving to both the same duties and functions in order to grant to both the same rights. We are not the same. We are equal. Being the same and being equal are two different things. We are not the same. Male and female are different. We have different emotions, different thoughts, different ways we see things different attributes. We are equal. We are not the same. But to amalgamate the sexes indiscriminately without regard for their different natures would force unlike things to be alike and may thereby pervert and degrade both. That is what is happening today by trying to make male and female the same. You are degrading both. You cannot make unlike things like the same thing. And Satan is convincing the world to try to do that. By contrast, the prophet's concept of the divine patriarchal order suggests that men ought to be true men and women true women, and that each person in the sphere marked out by nature and the divine plan of life and salvation ought to be according the rights and dignity of a child of God. A revelation given through Joseph Smith to his wife Emma expressed the new philosophy. Besides being appointed to make a selection of hymns for the church, she was to be set apart by the laying on of hands, to expound scriptures, and to exhort the church according as it shall be given thee by my spirit. She shall also to give her time to writing and to learning much. Nevertheless, the revelation instructed, Let thy soul delight in thy husband, and the glory which shall come unto him. Joseph Smith commented the words of the Apostle Paul to the saints that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. 
But in that position, man has no arbitrary rights and a woman had no obligation to follow her husband in any unrighteous exercise of authority. Women, you do not have to follow someone in unrighteousness. And brethren, you govern in unrighteousness, amen to the priesthood authority of that man. Section 121. She covenanted to obey his law only as he fulfills his covenant obligations to God. And her covenant was enforced only as long as he fulfilled those obligations. He was under the law of the priesthood, which required him to exercise authority in the home only by persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, and love unfeigned. If that is not happening, sisters, you are under no obligation to follow him where he is trying to use persuasion and not long-suffering and not being gentle and meek and is trying to exercise unrighteous authority. He was also expected to acquire pure knowledge of the principles of priesthood leadership and to act without hypocrisy and without guile. If he had to prove, reprove a member of his family with sharpness, it was to be only when he was truly moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And then he was to show afterwards an increase of love to the one reproved. Dr. Covenants 121, 41-43 Using the admonition of Paul as a basis of his statement, Prophet Joseph Smith wrote, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. You love your wife as Christ loved the church, which means you would sacrifice, brethren, anything for your wife and your children, even some of your own desires and feelings. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. A woman's obligation, on the other hand, was to give herself to her husband in mind and heart and body and to be a helpmate unto him, to sustain and support him as her head and as the head of their family. In that sacred relationship, they were to be one flesh under the law of God. They are to be equal. This required them to establish their lives on a spiritual plane which would sanctify the home and bring the blessings of the Holy Spirit into the lives of all the family members. A report of the prophet's address to the Re Society states, he exhorted the sisters always to consecrate their faith and prayers for and place confidence in their husbands whom God has appointed for them to honor. Again, when you go home, Never give a cross or unkind word to your husband, or let kindness, charity, and love crown your works henceforward. The world of men, not of women, is full of iniquity, Brigham Young charged. They are destroying every truth they can. They are destroying all innocence that they can. But under Zion's law, the influence of some men would not prevent women from acquiring the spiritual blessings which lead to exaltation in the presence of God if they desired it. The women are entitled to the kingdom, President Young continued. They are entitled to the glory. They are entitled to exaltation if they are obedient to the priesthood. And they will be crowned with those who are crowned. Just as I can only receive exaltation if I am obedient to the priesthood. Every woman could be sealed to a man who would be exalted and in this way receive spiritual blessings which might otherwise be denied her. President Howard W. Hunter taught the following regarding a husband's presiding role in the family. 
The Lord intended that the wife be a helpmeet for man. Meet means equal. That is a companion equal and necessary in full partnership. Presiding is righteousness in righteousness necessitates a shared responsibility between husband and wife. Together you act with knowledge and participation in all family matters. For a man to operate independent or without regard to the feelings and counsel of his wife in governing the family is to exercise unrighteous dominion. You are to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. End of quote. You do not have the right to say, I'm the priesthood holder, so this is the way it's going to be. That is not of God. 1 Corinthians 11, 4-9. These verses deal with local customs or traditions and their effect on living the gospel. Verse 4, Paul is saying, Now on this principle, if necessary, if any man were to worship with covered head, he would disgrace himself because the covered head is the symbol of inferior position. Remember, this is the customs in their day. Verse 5, In the same way every woman who worships without her veil, thus violating the custom among women of good character, acts discreditably and brings shame upon herself. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, women are not one whit behind men in spiritual things. Perhaps on the whole they are ahead of them. In the very nature of things, there will be more women than men living in the state of family exaltation hereafter. And women here and now are much entitled to revelation, visions, and gifts of the Spirit as are men. Verse 6. Indeed, she might as well have her hair cut short, and she knows the shame attached to that. We're going to see later that... Uh, hair cut short or shaven was a sign of a prostitute. So you can see why Paul's commenting on some of these things. Verse 7 through 9. A man is in the image and glory of God, so woman is the glory of man. Such specifies the relation, relative position of the sexes. Verse 7. The man, therefore, as receiving his authority directed from God, ought to keep his head uncovered in worship. Or as the woman should veil her head as the sign of her authority is derived from man. As the woman, Eve was created for the man, Adam, and not the reverse. So women are subordinate to men and are subject to their control only in righteousness. Not in control meaning in controlling them, but in guiding and directing the home in righteousness. Such is the practical rule that does and must exist between the sexes by virtue of the simple fact that there cannot be two equal heads. You can't have two equal heads or you would have chaos. 1 Corinthians 11, 10 through 12, verse 10. And this is the more necessary when remember that the angels are witnesses of Christian worship. Verses 11 and 12. But after all, in the Christian life, man and woman are dependent upon each other, just as they are in natural life, and in all things they are dependent upon God. As eternal life grows out of the continuation of the family unit in eternity, and as a family unit consists of a husband and a wife, so in the Lord it takes a man and a woman together to gain the glorious state of exaltation. Such is the whole object and end of the gospel, and as such, it forms a kind of degree of equality between the sexes, still, however, leaving the man to preside, meaning to exercise superintendence, to watch over as inspector, to make sure the righteous things get done. Someone has to be in charge so you can have order, that the two work together in equality. Over the <clears throat> to exercise, not leaving a man to preside over the woman as God presides over the man. Verses 11 and 12, men and women cannot be with the Lord eternally without each other. We are exalted only in couples. That keep the laws of exaltation. Paul affirmed to the saints in Corinth that men and women are mutually dependent and 
are meant to work together as they follow the Lord. This truth applies to worshiping and serving together in the church, and particularly to growing together in marriage relationships. President Joseph F. Smith spoke on how Paul's teaching applies to marriage. He quotes, No man can be saved and exalted in the kingdom of God without the woman, and no woman can reach the perfection and exaltation in the kingdom of God alone. God instituted marriage in the beginning. He made man in his own image and likeness, male and female, and in their creation it was designed that they should be united together in both bonds of marriage, and one is not perfect without the other. This is why, brethren, you have to can only preside in kindness, love unfeigned, without being controlling and, un, and using unrighteous dominion. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, further clarified the mutual dependency of men and women, quoting, after the earth was created, Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden. Importantly, however, God said it was not good that man should be alone, and Eve became Adam's wife and helpmeet. The unique combination of spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional capacities of both males and females was needed to enact the plan of happiness. Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.11 11. The man and the woman are independent to learn from, strengthen, bless, and complete each other. End his quote. In Hebrew, the definition of help me is an aid, a helper, who is equal to you. So that's what he means when he called Eve a help meet. She is equal to him and corresponding. We're different in nature, have different qualities, and that's why we need each other. In connection with these basic gospel principles, Paul comments on local customs and traditions. For instance, that a woman should have her head covered when she prays or prophesies. These she be as though her head were shaven, which according to local customs would adult identify her as an adulteress. In the eternal sense, it is wholly immaterial whether a woman wears a hat or is bareheaded when she prays. In Paul's day, the bare head was irreverent. In ours, reverence and respect are shown by removing the hat. In other words, gospel principles are eternal, and it is wise to adhere to the passing, cu passing customs which signify adherence to that course which adds to, rather, than detracts from the great, important, revealed truths. 1 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Verses 13 and 15, Paul is saying, Now, just say yourselves, if it is seemingly for a man to worship, of, I'm sorry, a woman to worship on veiled. Why, even nature, giving her long hair for a natural veil, assists the contrary. Verse 14. Natural, that is, the natural order of things, a man's sense of its fitness. Verse 15. The argument is that God, by providing woman with the natural veil, has taught that she ought to cover her head before him. So he's trying to show how certain customs fit in with the gospel, and we should follow them just like we have certain customs we follow that President Hinckley has told us not to pierce our whole bodies so that we become like the world and that we treat them with respect. 1 Corinthians 16.22 The Sacrament of the Lord's Supper The Savior instituted the sacrament during the meal that was eaten at the Last Supper. Early members of the church maintained a practice of partaking of a meal together followed by the administration of the sacrament. The mills were signs of peace, unity, and fellowship shared by the members of the congregation, and they were also a means of ministering to members' temporal needs. These mills were, however, sometimes the, sor the source of discord when the food was eaten before all members could arrive, causing some to go hungry and become upset with their fellow saints. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 17-22. This nullified one of the purposes of coming together, to build fellowship as they partook of the Lord's Supper. Paul taught the saints to take steps to avoid this kind of contention and maintain harmony. 
They should wait for everyone to arrive before evening, eating, and if any were still hungry after the meal, they should eat later at home. The early saints apparently adopted the practice of eating together a meal and supper and then partaking of the sacrament. Abuses avoiding, involving selfishness and drunkenness seem to have arisen in connection with this feasting. There are here condemned, and the saints are counseled to eat at home and then assemble with their fellow church members to renew their covenants and their sacramental ordinance. Remember, the apostles, one of their jobs is to regulate the affairs of the church. Paul is here regulating the affairs of the church of some things that are getting out of hand. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, Heresies abound in the sectarian world. False doctrines are manifest on every hand. God is not a spirit essence without body, parts, or passions that fills a men's city and is nowhere in particular present, for instance. Nor is it true that revelation ceases ceased with the ancient apostles. But what of the true church? Are there heresies with even that divine institu institution? Paul says such was the case among the Corinthians, and it is apparent that the same thing prevails in the modern kingdom of God on earth. Speaking of our day, Nephi said that, quote, because of pride and wickedness and abomination and whoredoms, all men have gone astray, save it be a few who are who are the humble followers of Christ, end of his quote. Then pointing to these true saints, he added, quote, Nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of man, 2 Nephi 28, 14. That is, heresies are found in the church today, even as in the meridian of time. For instance, what are the views of some on revelation, on the age of the earth, on the theories of organic evolution? on the resurrection of the sons of perdition, on a second chance for salvation, on whether God is progressing in truth and knowledge, and so forth. The fact is that a major part of the testing process of mortality is to determine how much of the truth the saints will believe while they are walking by faith rather than by sight. And the more truth they accept, the clearer will be their views on spiritual matters and the more incentive and determination they will have to work out their salvation and gain eternal glory hereafter. Heresies and false teachings are thus used in the testing process of this mortal probation. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-24 When Christ instituted the ordinance of the sacrament, he and his apostles were celebrating the feast of the Passover. The partaking of the emblems of his broken flesh and spilled blood was part of and grew out of this paschal, paschal mill. Verse 23 through 25, he is saying the ordinance of sacrament, replacing the ordinance of sacrifice, is rep repetitiously performed right, whereby the true saints center their worship in Christ and his atoning sacrifice and thereby they renew and reaffirm the covenant made in the waters of baptism, thus again attaining a state of full, shell, full shell fellowship with the Lord through the consequent remission of their sins. Verse 26, The sacramental ordinance was destined to continue among two saints until and after the second coming of the Son of Man, when Christ himself will again partake with all his holy saints of the emblems of his broken flesh and spilled blood. That's in D&C 27, 5 through 14. Verses 27 through 29. Personal worthiness is an essential pre prerequisite in all gospel ordinances. Otherwise, the performances are not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, thus gaining eff efficacy, virtue, and force for this life and for the life to come. DNC 7653, 132, verse 7. Thus Moroni counsels, see that you partake not of the sacrament of Christ unworthily. Mormon 929. Similarly, in latter day revelation, we find this degree. If any have trespassed, let him not partake until he makes reconciliation. DNC 64, 4. 
and the resurrected Lord ministered among the Nephite commands, quote, Ye shall not suffer anyone knowingly to partake of the, my flesh and my blood unworthily, when ye shall minister it. For whoso eateth and drinketh my flesh and blood unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to his soul. Therefore, if ye know that a man is unworthy to eat and drink of my flesh and blood, ye shall forbid him. Nevertheless, ye shall not cast him out from among you, but ye shall minister unto him, and ye shall pray for him unto the Father in my name. And if it so be that he repenteth and is baptized in my name, then ye shall receive him, and shall minister unto him of my flesh and blood. But if he repenteth not, he shall not be numbered among my people, that he may not destroy my people. For behold, I know my sheep, and they are numbered. Nevertheless, ye are not to cast him out of your synagogues or your places of worship. For unto such ye shall continue to minister. For ye know not but what that they will return and repent and come unto men with full purpose of heart. And I shall heal them, and ye shall be the means of bringing salvation unto them. 3 Nephi 18, 28-32 Verse 27 Guilty of the blood of I'm sorry, guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Paul was meaning, this penalty applies only to those who partake of the sacrament in total and complete unworthiness and rebellion. It is only this class of damned souls whose hands, in full sense of the word, the blood of Christ is found. Verse 28, partaking of the sacrament is a time for us to examine ourselves, our thoughts, words, and deeds to see and consider if we are becoming like the Savior. Yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and all things and all places that ye may be in, even until death, that ye may be redeemed of God and be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that you may have eternal life. Mosiah 18, 9. Therefore prepare ye the way of the Lord, for the time is at hand that all men shall reap a reward of their works according to that which they have been. Notice Alma does not say according to which they have done. We have to get beyond just doing things in the gospel. We have to become like God. Back, back to the quote. If they have been righteous, not just doing righteous things, but have been righteous, they shall reap the salvation of their souls according to the power and deliverance of Jesus Christ. And if they have been evil, they shall reap the damnation of their souls according to the power and captivity of the devil. Alma 9, 28. Verse 30. Both temporal and spiritual sickness and death are here promised those saints who partake unworthily of the sacrament. They are spiritually diseased and sometimes dead because of sins committed after baptism, sins which are not remitted anew by obtaining the Holy Spirit poured out upon those who worthily partake of the blessed emblems of Christ's flesh and blood. And also many among them suffer physical illness and temporal death when such through faith might be avoided. Verses 31-32 if we would but judge ourselves to realize our true condition, we should not be so judged. But this judgment is the Lord's chastening to save us from final condemnation with the world. So we should examine ourselves, judge ourselves. How are we doing in the gospel? Verse 33. Therefore, avoid this greedy selfishness. Verse 34. And satisfy your appetite at home that your meetings may not bring down a judgment upon you. Other matters I will settle when I come. This is probably referring back to the mills they were holding at their homes and getting out of hand before the sacrament that they should eat before they could come eat their mill before they come to partake of the sacrament. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Paul noted that before the saints in Corinth had converted to the gospel, they were carried away unto these dumb, voiceless idols, even as you were led. 1 Corinthians 12, 2. 
In contrast to powerless, voiceless idols, the saints could rely on the powerful influence of the Holy Ghost as a source of testimony. 1 Corinthians 12.3 If the saints are to be saved, they must accept, understand, and experience the gifts of the Spirit. Since religion itself is of the Spirit and deals with spiritual things, it can be received and known only by the power of the Spirit. Thus, where the gifts of the Spirit are manifest, there is true religion. And where the gifts of the Spirit are not manifest, the true religion is not. Hence, in his farewell to the Lamanites, Moroni counsel, I exhort you, my brethren, that, you do not, that ye deny not the gifts of God, for there are many. Moroni 10.8 The prophet Joseph Smith taught the word say in 1 Corinthians 12, 3 should be understood as no, thus clarifying that no man can know that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. President M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of obtaining a testimony through the Holy Ghost. A testimony is a witness or confirmation of eternal truth impressed upon individuals' hearts and souls through the Holy Ghost, whose primary ministry is to testify of truth, particularly as it relates to the Father and the Son. Simply stated, testimony, real testimony, born of the Spirit and confirmed, confirmed by the Holy Ghost, changes life. It changes how you think and what you do. It changes what you say. It affects every priority you set and every choice you make. So if you're not changing in terms of becoming less like the, wor the world, then you may want to consider the state your testimony is in. Verse 2, Gentiles, which include all non-members of the church, do not have the gifts of the Spirit. These spiritual outpourings of divine grace are reserved for those who have the gift of the Holy Ghost, who is the very Spirit whose, who is the very Spirit whose gifts are are bestowed upon men. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 through 11, gifts of the Spirit defined. The gifts lifted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 are referred to as spiritual gifts or gifts of the Spirit. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained, spiritual gifts come from God. They are the gifts of God. They originate with him and are special blessings that he bestows upon those who love him and keep his commandments. The prophet Joseph Smith confirmed that Latter-day Saints believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healings, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. Articles of Faith 7. Other books of scripture, including Moroni 10 and Doctrine and Covenants 46, supplement our understanding of spiritual gifts. For example, the Doctrine and Covenants teaches that Heavenly Father gives spiritual gifts to his children to the Holy Ghost for their benefit. Doctrine and Covenants 46, 8 through 10, and then verse 26 says, verse 8, Wherefore, beware, lest ye are deceived, and that ye may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts. Always remember for what they are given. Verse 9, For verily I say unto you, they are given for the benefit of those who love me, and keep all my commandments and him that seeketh to do so, that all may be benefited that seek or ask of me, that ask and not for a sign that they may be consumed on their lusts. Spiritual gifts will never be given as a sign of a true church, as a sign to help convert somebody. Verse 10, And again, verily I say unto you, I would that you should always remember and always retain in your mind what those gifts are. They are given unto the church. In verse 26, and all these gifts come from God for the benefit of the children of God. Paul explained that the gifts of the Spirit enable disciples to effectively administer and serve in God's kingdom and meet the needs of others. 1 Corinthians 12, 5-7. By using the terms the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 6, Paul recognized that spiritual gifts are manifestations of the united work of all three members of the Godhead. The following chart lists the spiritual gifts specifically listed by Paul. So one was the testimony of Jesus. That's, these are all in 1 Corinthians 12. That's verse 3. 
a witness given through the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the resurrected living Son of the living God. There's five differences of administration, meaning leadership or administrative abilities, which is used in his ministering and regulating the church. The ability to discern correctly how the Lord governs his church through councils, quorums, auxiliaries, and so on. Verse 6 is diversities of operations, meaning the ability to distinguish between things that are of the devil and those that are of God. Verse 8, word of wisdom, includes sound judgment and the proper application of gospel doctrine principles, particularly in decision making. Paul's use of word shows that the gift of wisdom includes the ability to teach a message of wisdom by the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 8, word of knowledge. An endowment of knowledge, not random knowledge, not knowledge in general or as an abstract principle, but gospel knowledge, a knowledge of God and his laws. Again, God, Paul's choice of word emphasizes that this gift includes the ability to teach knowledge by the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 9, faith, the gift of faith, experienced by degrees and increased through righteous living, not everyone has the same degree of faith. This gift is prerequisite for both healing and working miracles. Verse 9, healing. Manifest through priesthood ordinance to pray with faith. Sufficient for healing is also a spiritual gift. Verse 10, the gift of working of miracles. Signs of God's grace which affirm that divine power is at work. They are a reminder that God assists those who follow the example of the Savior and minister others. Verse 10, prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10. Personal revelation is the source of testimony, and testimony enables a person to prophesy or testify of God's work, including his future work. The gift of prophecy does not necessarily mean specific future events. All members of the church are to seek for this gift. The gift of prophecy should not be confused with the prophetic office of a prophet, seer, or revelator. We do not have any gift to be a prophet, seer, and revelator and prophesy in that dimension. That's only the first presidency in the twelve. The gift of discerning of spirits. Discernment of good and evil and of false spirits from divine spirits, the gift of discernment, can make known the thoughts and intents and hearts of other person. The gift of discernment also lar arises largely out of an acute sense of impressions, spiritual impressions, to detect hidden evil, and more importantly, to find the good that may be concealed. The highest type of discernment is that which perceives in others and uncovers for them their better natures, the good inherent within them. The gift of tongues, verse 10, particularly instituted for the preaching of the gospel to other nations and languages. Speak, since speaking in tongues is one of the most visible and sought after spiritual gifts, Paul warned against its misuse. The interpretation of tongues, verse 10, should be accompanied with an interpreted, inspired interpretation so that listeners are edified. President George Q. Cannon taught concerning spiritual gifts, quote, If any of us are imperfect, it is our duty to pray for the gift that will make us perfect. Have I imperfections? I am full of them. What is my duty? to pray to God to give me the gifts that will correct these imperfections. If I am an angry man, man, it is my duty to pray for charity, who has suffered long and is kind. Am I an envious man? It is my duty to seek for charity, which envieth not. So with all the gifts of the gospel. They are intended for this purpose. No man ought to say, oh, I can't help this. It is in my nature. He is not justified in it for the reason that God has promised to give strength to correct these things and to give given gifts that will eradicate them. So the gifts lifted in the Doctrine and Covenants and the ones we just read from Paul are not all the gifts of the Spirit. He's just given examples. Anything to help us to become perfected that comes from the Holy Ghost is a gift of the Spirit. Anything I need to correct my imperfections. 
A Labusama Conchi taught, spiritual gifts are endless in number and infinite in variety. See 1 Corinthians 12.4. Those listed in the revealed world word are simply illustrations of the boundless outpourings of divine grace that a gracious God gives those who love and serve him. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, said, And all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ, and they come unto every man severally, according as he will. And I would exhort you, my beloved brethren, that you remember that every good gift cometh of Christ. And all these gifts come from God for the benefit of the children of God, and unto the bishops of the church, and unto such as God shall appoint and ordain to watch over the church and to be elders unto the church. So he's talking about the first presidency in the 12, are to have it given unto them to discern all those gifts. Least there shall be any among you professing and yet not be of God. So the first presidency of the 12 are to have all the gifts of, it's to have the gifts of discernment so that they can discern when false things are being taught. Whence come a spiritual gifts? Paul says they come from the Spirit, meaning the Holy Ghost. The Latter-day Revelation on spiritual gifts say they come from God, meaning the Father. Ramon, Moroni calls them the gifts of God, but says that they come from Christ. And also that they come by the Spirit of Christ, meaning the light of Christ, which proceed the force from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. And all of these inspired declarations are true. Each is in perfect harmony with all the others. Certainly they are the gifts of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. They come from the Father in that He is the source and center of creation and of all things. They come from Christ because He represents the Father, acts in His name and power, and is the one to whom all men look for salvation. They come from the Holy Ghost because He is the minister of the Father and the Son, the one appointed to give revelation and to bestow the gifts of the gods upon all men, uh, upon men, all of which exemplify the perfect unity and oneness of the members of the Godhead. Further, they come by means of the Spirit of Christ, meaning the light of Christ, because that light is the law by which all things are governed. It is the light in all things and through all things and around about all things. It is the agency of God's power. It is the vehicle used by the Holy Ghost to manifest his power in all places at all times. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 30, are ye the body of Christ? Paul used the analogy of the human body to show how each individual member is essential to the entire body of the church. Paul noted that the human body operates as one whole, but is made up of many parts or members, each of which is important. Paul pointed out that the body would not work properly if the whole body were only the eye or the ear. When people are baptized, they become members of the body of Christ, meaning Christ's church. Because each member is given unique offices, duties, and spiritual gifts, each can play an important role in the church, just as every member of the body is important. When members perform responsibilities and minister to the needs of others with their gifts and talents, the whole, the church as a whole is blessed. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught that all members of the church can make valuable contributions in their ward or branches, quoting, Your obligation is as serious in your sphere of responsibility as my obligation in my sphere. No calling in this church is small or of little consequence. All of us in the pursuit of our duty touch the lives of others. To each of us is our respective responsibilities, the Lord has said. Wherefore, be faithful, stand in the office which I have appointed unto you, succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. End of quote. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency similarly taught, quote, You may feel that there are others who are more capable or more experienced, or who could fulfill your calling and assignment better than you can. But the Lord gave you your responsibilities for a reason. There may be people and hearts only you can reach and touch. 
perhaps no one else could do it in quite the same way. End of quote. 1 Corinthians 12.31 Covet earnestly the best gifts. Now notice in the list of scriptures I'm about to give you how we are commanded not to covet it. Exodus 10.17 Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his main servant, nor his maid servant, nor his axe, nor his ass, nor anything that is his neighbor's. Psalms one nineteen thirty six Incline mine heart unto thy testimony, and not to covetousness. Luke twelve fifteen And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things of which he possesseth. Ephesians 5.3, But fornication and all cleanliness or, or covenantness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Doctrine and Covenants 104, verse 4, Therefore, inasmuch as some of my servants have not kept the commandments, but have broken the covenant through covenantness with feigned words, I have cursed them with a very sore and grievous curse. The Lord is insistent upon not us on, on covetousness, that it, it, it can be damning to us. Yet in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, we are told to covet the gifts of the Spirit. You see how strong he is trying to teach us to seek after them? A word he uses that we should never do, he now uses, there are, I want you to covet the gifts of the Spirit. Meaning, we should diligently be earnest in seeking out the gifts from the Holy Ghost that will benefit the church and help me overcome those weaknesses of the natural man that are keeping me from becoming like God. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, covet earnestly the best gifts. Robert D. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Corma 12 explained, a prerequisite for seeking after the gifts may require that we find out which gifts we have been given, the scriptures for the record. And again, verily I say unto you, I would that you would always remember and always retain in your minds what those gifts are that they are given to the church. For all have not every gift given unto them, for there are many gifts. And to every man is given a gift by the Spirit of God. Dr. Covenant 46, 10-11. We all have at least one naturally given to us, and we are to seek many others, or covet after many others, as we've already seen. To find, back to his quote, to find the gifts we have been given, we must pray and fast. Often patriarchal blessings tell us the gifts we have received, and declare the promise of gifts we can receive if we seek after them. I urge each of you to discover your gifts and to seek after those that will bring direction to your life's work and that will further the work of heaven. During our time here on earth, we have been charged to develop the natural gifts and capacity, capabilities Heavenly Father has blessed us with. Then it will be our opportunity to use these gifts to become teachers and leaders of God's children whenever they may be found on earth. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, and chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, Charity. It was Joseph B. Wilson explained why Paul called the gift of charity a more excellent way, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, and why love should be at the center of every disciple's life. Paul's message to the Corinthian saints was simple and direct. Nothing you do makes of a difference if you do not have charity. You can speak with tongues, have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries, and possess all knowledge, even if you have the faith to move mountains without charity, it won't profit you at all. See 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 2. Charity is the pure love of Christ, Moroni 7, 47. The Savior exemplified that love and taught it even as he was tormented by those who despised and hated him. He gave love to those who deserved no love. In 1840, the prophet Joseph Smith sent an epistle to the Twelve wherein he taught that love is one of the chief characteristics of deity and ought to be manifested by those who aspire to be the sons of God. 
A man filled with the love of God is not content with blessing his family alone, but ranges through the whole world anxious to bless the whole human race. Love is the beginning, the middle, and the end of pathway of discipleship. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, 13, 1 through 8, Charity. As you study the attributes of what makes up charity, see verses 4 through 7, it becomes apparent that what is being described for us here are the attributes of Christ. Thus, Christ equals, I'm sorry, thus charity equals Christ. As we develop the attributes of charity in our lives, we are becoming like Christ. We are developing his attributes. This is why Paul says that without charity, ye are nothing. Because for without Christ, we are nothing. In the sense that we would remain slaves of the grave at death and not be able to progress and gain eternal life. We would remain in hell. John 15, 4-5 states, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch can bear fruit of itself, except it abideth in the vine, no more can ye, except, can ye except you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same abideth forth much, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, Ye can do nothing. That's why we need charity. Charity is developing the attributes of Christ and becoming like him. And without becoming like Christ, we will become nothing. This is why charity never faileth, because Christ will never fail us. Charity is an essential qualification for ministers of Christ. No one can assist in the Lord's work without it, and the saints of God are commanded to seek and attain it. Charity is a gift of the Spirit which must be gained if one is to have salvation. There must be faith, Moroni writes, and if there must be faith, there all also must also be hope. And if there must be hope, there also must also be charity. And except you have charity, you can in no wise be saved in the kingdom of God. Neither can you be saved in the kingdom of God if you have not faith. Neither can you if you have no hope. Romans 10, 20-21 The Lord enlightened Moroni about charity, saying, Faith, hope, and charity bringeth unto me the fountain of all righteousness. And Moroni and I replied to the Lord, being of course moved upon by the Holy Ghost, I remember that thou hast said that thou hast loved the world, even unto the laying down of thy life for the world, that thou might take it again, it again to prepare a place for the children of men. And now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Wherefore, except men shall have charity, they cannot inherit that place which thou hast prepared in the mansions of the Father. Ether 12, 28, and 33-34. Moroni 7, 46-48 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if ye have not charity, ye are nothing, for charity never faileth. Wherefore, Cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all, for all things must fail. But charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And those who is found possessed of it, isn't that interesting? We must be possessed of it. At the last day, it shall be well with him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart, that ye may be filled with his love which he has bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be pure even as he is pure. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says, I am becometh a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, 
He's, he is referring to meaning that I am just making noise. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, these verses must be interpreted in the context of Paul's whole presentation on charity and spiritual gifts. They are a form of reasoning and argumentation designed to dramatize the preeminent position of charity among the attributes of godliness, and standing alone, they are not to be taken literally. It is not possible, for instance, to have faith without first having charity. But by seeking as though faith to move mountains is as nothing compared to charity, the point is driven home that there is nothing so transcendent as having the pure love of Christ in one's soul. In principle, it is though, in order to emphasize the importance of the family unit, a man should so say, though I gain exaltation itself, and have not my wife but my, by my side, I shall have nothing, a thing which is impossible, for exaltation consists in the continuation of the family unit in eternity. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 through 4 and 12, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Paul pointed out that charity suffereth long and is kind, 13.4. When we have charity, we patiently endure offense or hardship. We also act in patience and kindness to everyone, even those who offend us, even those who do not deserve it. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency taught, We do not know the hearts of those who offend us, nor do we know all the sources of our, of our own anger and hurt. The Apostle Paul tells us how to love in a world of imperfect people, including ourselves, when he said, Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity embereth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not be self, itself, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. And then he gave solemn warning against reenacting to the fault of others and forgetting our own when he wrote for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now I know in part but then shall I know even as I am known 1st Corinthians 12 8 through 10 shall the gifts of the Spirit cease is there a day to be a day when the saints shall no longer possess the gifts of tongues or the gift of knowledge yes in the sense that these shall all these shall be swallowed up in something greater and shall no longer be needed in the perfect day. When the saints know all tongues, none will be able to speak in an unknown tongue. When the saints become as God and know all things, present, past, present, and future, there will be no need or occasion to prophesy of the future. 1 Corinthians 13.8 Charity never faileth. Like the Apostle Paul, the prophet Mormon also taught that charity would never fail, and he gave a simple definition of this gift. Charity is the pure love of Christ. Elder Jeffrey R. Harlan, Jeffrey R. Harlan spoke of the true charity as Christ's pure love, which will never fail. Quoting, the greater definition of the pure love of Christ, however, is not what we as Christians try but largely fail to demonstrate towards others, but rather what Christ totally succeeded in demonstrating towards us. True charity has been known only once. It is shown perfectly and purely in Christ's unfailing, ultimate, and atoning love for us. It is Christ's love for us that suffereth long and is kind and envieth not. It is his love for us that is not puffed up, not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. It is Christ's love for us that beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. It is as demonstrated in Christ that charity never faileth. It is that charity, his pure love for us, without which we would be nothing, hopeless of all men and women most miserable. Truly, those found possessed of the blessing of his love at the last day, the atonement, the resurrection, the eternal life, the eternal promise, surely it shall be well with them. 
Life has its share of fears and failures. Sometimes things fall short. Sometimes people fail us. Our economies or businesses or government fail us. But one thing in time and eternity does not fail us. The pure love of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, look through a dark, a, look through a glass darkly. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, At the heart of God's plan for your happiness is your power to choose. Of course, your Heavenly Father wants you to choose eternal joy with Him, and He will help you to achieve it, but He would never force it upon you. So He allows you to choose light or darkness, good or evil, joy or misery, eternal life or spiritual death. It sounds like an easy choice, doesn't it? But somehow, here on earth, it seems more complicated than it ought to be. The problem is that we don't always see things as clearly as we would like to. The Apostle Paul compared it to looking through a glass darkly. There's a lot of confusion in the world about what is right and wrong. Truth gets twisted to make evil seem good and good seem evil. But when you earnestly seek the truth, the eternal, unchanging truth, your choices become much clearer. Yes, you still have temptations and trials. Bad things still happen, puzzling things, tragic things. But you can manage when you know who you are, why you are here, and when you trust God. 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, Faith, Hope, and Charity. Paul referred to faith, hope, and charity as the three principles that abideth, meaning they endure or last forever. Ever. Elder Emerson Ballard explained the relationship among these principles. The Apostle Paul taught that three divine principles form a foundation upon which we can build the structure of our lives. They are faith, hope, and charity. See 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Together, they give us a base of support like the legs of a three-legged stool. Each principle is significant within itself, but each also plays an important supporting role. Each is incomplete without the others. Hope helps faith develop. Likewise, true faith help gives birth to hope. When we begin to lose hope, we are faltering also in our measure of faith. The principles of faith and hope working together must be accompanied by charity, which is the greatest of all. According to Mormon, charity is the pure love of, pure love of Christ and it endureth forever. It is the perfect manifestation of our faith and hope. Working together, these three princi eternal principles will help give us the broad eternal perspective we need to face life's toughest challenges, including the prophesied ordeals of the last days. Real faith fosters hope for the future. It allows us to look beyond ourselves and our present cares. Fortified by hope, we are moved to demonstrate the pure love of Christ through daily acts of obedience and Christian service. May we work on faith, brother, or charity, brothers and sisters. May we work on these attributes and becoming more like Christ. And may we do it through prayer, fasting, real intent. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.